So Walt Whitman was Ralph Waldo Emerson's truest disciple. And Whitman, in his poetry, fulfilled Emerson's theories. He begins his most famous work, Song of Myself, this way. I celebrate myself and seeing myself and what I assume you shall assume. For every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. So it's this audacious statement that I'm celebrating myself and I'm not apologizing for it. Um, again, um, one could interpret that as narcissism. Whitman, I suppose, would say narcissism is just a label that he transcends. Uh, like Emerson, Whitman uh, believes that in, in transcending dichotomies. A lot that you see in this poem uh, is what we call the dialectical um, technique where Whitman will put two things that we normally consider opposites, male, female, sun and moon, city and the country, and he will say that he embraces all of that. He says, I am the poet of the body and the soul, for instance. And, and rather than say one is good and what is, one is bad, he says, he even says good and bad are, are just categories to transcend, that he embraces all of the above. And the bad, he says, he just translates it into something else. So um, again, I, I think Emerson in some ways borrowed a, a lot of his philosophy from, you know, Eastern uh, religions, like Buddhism, Hinduism, where there's this, you know, there's like the idea of the yin and the yang, these two opposites that have to be in balance. But in some ways, I guess you could say Whitman even goes beyond that, not just keeping them in balance, but seeing that those opposites are somehow an illusion to be transcended uh, ultimately. Um, so Whitman, you know, he, he was really considered scandalous uh, at the time that, that he wrote um, because he was, if, if you've read the song of myself, you, you've probably already noticed how overtly sexual it is. I'll read you some examples here shortly, but uh, that, that was definitely taboo at that time. You didn't write directly about things like orgasms. I mean, he doesn't use the, the word orgasm, but it, it doesn't take um, much imagination to see in some of these passages. That's exactly what he's describing. Also, Whitman was a homosexual or maybe bisexual. Uh, again, there, there's some it's a pretty well established fact, and there again, there are clues in the in the poem itself. So, um, you know, his song of myself was considered just a nasty, perverted um, string of of a kind of absurdity. You know, not not a poem at all. In part because he broke away from a lot of the conventions of poetry. He used free verse, right? It, we we saw. And Poe, for instance, very um, regular meter and rhyme scheme and, and all of that. You don't see any of that in, in Whitman. Now, it doesn't mean Whitman didn't have any structure. Um, you know, he, he does use um, some different kinds of repetition. He uses anaphora, for instance, anaphora, A-N-A-P-H-O-R-A. And that is just the repetition of the same word or phrase over and over. So you can look on practically any page of the poem and see that. So in stanza two or section two, for instance, the play of shine and shade, the delight alone, the feeling of health. And then have you reckoned, have you practiced, have you felt, then you shall possess, you shall no longer, you shall not look through, you shall listen. So repeating the these and then the haves and then the use. Uh, that, uh, by the way, Whitman borrows that technique from the King James Bible uh, in, in the Bible, and and, and it's it's becomes even more obvious in the King James um, 
translation of the Bible, there's a lot of anaphora because the, the ancient Hebrew poets use that device as well. Um, there's also um, kind of combining anaphora and this dialectical approach. I think one of the sources for that in Whitman uh, is also the, the Bible. Uh, most obviously, perhaps, if you look at Ecclesiastes. So if you look at our modules, I, I included a link to Ecclesiastes. I forget, there's one chapter in particular that really, that makes it really obvious, but it's, to paraphrase, it's, it, it's where um, King Solomon, who wrote Ecclesiastes, says, you know, there's a, there's a time to, uh, a time to reap and a time to sow, a time to, a time to kill and a time to live. Again, I'm paraphrasing. I don't have it right in front of me, but there's all these opposites. And Solomon is saying, look, life is made up of all these opposites and apparent uh, contradictions. And there's a time for, for all of that. So Whitman's borrowing from that and, and claiming that he has transcended all of that. Uh, toward the end of the, the poem, for instance, uh, I mean, at the very, the very end, really, toward the very end, he says, do I contradict myself? Very, very well, then, I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. And certain sections of the poem, he claims to be the, not just the spokesperson, but somehow to have literally become the farmer, the prisoner, the slave, that he, again, it's this kind of mystical idea of, becoming one with everything, becoming one uh, with the universe. Um, and that includes theology, ecumenicalism. Ecumenicalism is this, this idea that all the different religions are ultimately the same, that they're all wor worshiping the same God, whether he is called Yahweh or, or um, uh, Allah, or Buddha, or, you know, that the ecumenalist uh, point of view is that, uh, you know, those are all kind of parts of, of the truth, if you will. So it, it's kind of, I guess you'd say it's a natural progression from the Unitarianism, you know, that Emerson grew up with. An example of this ecumenical um, kind of thinking, uh, Let's see. Yeah. He says, I do not, this is in section 43 or stanza 43 of the poem. I do not despise you priest all time the world over. My faith is the greatest of faiths and the least of faiths. Again, this kind of dialectic, the greatest and the least all at the same time. Um, let's see. So he says, helping the, the Lama or Brahmin as he trims the lamps of the idols, dancing yet through the streets in phallic procession, wrapped in austere, drinking mead from the skull cap to Shastas and Vedas, Vedas of uh, Hinduism, admirant, minding the Quran, um, walking the Tikalis, not sure what that is, but then accepting the gospels, accepting him that was crucified, knowing assuredly that he is divine, so he's claiming that he embraces all. Yeah, I believe the Gospels, but also believe the Quran. I believe, um, you know, the Vedas. It reminds me, uh, I went on a, a trip to India a number of years ago, and <clears throat> they, our cab driver, he had a statue of Ganesh. He was one of the, the you know, many gods in Hinduism. He's the, the guy with the, like the, you know, the elephant. Uh, I think it's, yeah, I think it's elephant head. And uh, a guy who was with me uh, um, asked him about Ganesh, and he said, "Yeah, he said, well, my friends and I here, we, you know, we worship Jesus." And, and this cat, Indian cab driver said, "Oh yeah, I do too. Jesus is one of my gods, right?" So the, the, this is kind of what uh, Whitman is is claiming for himself as well that he's. Um, I, I don't have this one marked, but he says, "I am." Um, vast, I contain multitudes. Um, so this, again, this, th th that helps kind of explain what, what Emerson and company meant by the word 
transcendentalism. They believe they could transcend all these categories and, and dichotomies and not be pigeonholed into any one, one thing. Okay. <clears throat> Another thing, uh, I touched upon this earlier about how, you know, Whitman was not shy about expressing uh, sexuality. Let me give you a couple of examples. First of all, one that's a little less direct, but he says, I harbor for good or bad. I permit to speak at every hazard, nature without check, with original energy. This original energy elsewhere he calls a kind of procreative urge. He says, rather than be ashamed of our you know, natural impulses, we should embrace them. He, on the same page, he, he talks about being, he says, I will go to the bank by the wood and become undisguised and naked, right? Even clothes are even too much of a hindrance. They're, you know, cultural baggage that we should free ourselves of being unconventional. Um, so um, another example here, and I guess it's still section or Section three, stanza three. He says, urge and urge and urge. Always the procreant urge of the world. That, that was what I was looking for earlier. I paraphrased it. One of the dimness opposite equals advance. Opposite equals advance. Again, the dialectical method. You take two opposites, but you, you synthesize them. You, you see how they connect and then you transcend that dichotomy to something new. Always substance and increase, always sex. Doesn't get much, much more direct than that. He says, um, clear and sweet is my soul and clear and sweet is all that is not my soul. Lack one lacks both and the unseen is proved by the seen. He says, I think I have it marked here. Uh, I, I don't know if, if I, I guess I don't have it marked, but there's one passage where he, he directly says, I am the poet of the body and the soul, right? I'm not going to, he's saying, you know, it may be uh, conventional for <clears throat> some modes of thought to say, well, the soul is pure and good. Body is evil and bad. Matter is, is bad. By the way, that was the Gnostic heresy. The first heresy in the early church was Gnosticism, which uh, among its tenets was this idea that all matter is bad. And some people think, you know, people who are not all that well-versed in the Bible have that, that stereotype about Christianity. They think, oh, well, that's a Christian belief. It's not. Um, Orthodox Christianity... It, the center at the center of it was the idea that God spirit became matter but it became uh, uh, you know incarnate and so if that wouldn't even make sense if the the you know the biblical principle is that matter in and of itself is evil it's not God created matter accord, again according to Genesis and it's not that matter there's something evil about matter itself it's that there was a fall uh, and and yeah, of course, the Bible also says that, that there are evil spirits. So it's, so it's not that matter, bad, spirit, good. It, that's a, a vast oversimplification to, to say the least. That, and, and again, so uh, Whitman, again, says, I'm the, the poet of the body and the soul. Um, I wanted to find some other examples um, I mean, for instance, he, if we look at, let's see what the section is here. Yeah. Uh, section 22. You, you see, I resign myself to you also. I guess what you mean, my dog's whining. Um, I behold from the bench your crooked inviting fingers. I believe you refuse to go back without feeling of me. We must have a turn together. I undress, hurry me out of sight of the land, cushion me soft, rock me in billowy drowse, dash me with amorous wet. I can repay you. 
Okay, I'm, you know, it doesn't take much imagination to see what he's really uh, talking about there. He elsewhere he, he describes 28 men bathing, and you know is admiring that. He says, "I am the poet of the woman, the same as the man, and I say it is as great to be a woman as to be a man." Hey, Odie, let's say hi to everyone. Um, and I say there's nothing greater than the mother of men. So as you can imagine, Whitman is really popular among modern feminists um, as well. Um, you want to help me, bud? Want to help me with this lecture? <laughs> uh, I, it'd be perfect if I uh, could find right now the, the passage where he talks about his love of animals. Um, of course, I, I didn't mark that one, so... Uh, let's see. Hold on, Benny. Ah, went back too far. Okay. Hey, Rhett. Sorry, let me shovel him out of here real quick so he can. I'll be right back. Rhett. Hey, hey, can you take your roadie or Rhett? I'm doing a, a lecture. Thank you. All right. Again, real life. Um, so <clears throat> let's see, um, again, this, this idea of this mystical unity with, you know, every, everything becoming one, here's a good example of that. And excuse me, um, let's see, he said, this is section 16. I resist anything better than my own diversity, breathe the air, but leave plenty after me, and am not stuck up and am in my place. Um, the, these are really the thoughts of all men in all ages and lands. They are not original with me. Um, so it's still not exactly the, the passage I was looking for. It, there's... Um, mm, I can't find it. Essentially, he's saying here and elsewhere, he says, I am everyone, right? I, I encompass all, all walks of life. Uh, let's see, on the next page, yeah, he, he has this, this idea of equality. Or this is section 19. He says, this is the meal equally set. This the meat for natural hunger. It is for the wicked, just the same as the righteous. I make appointments with all. I will not have a single person slighted or left away. The kept woman, sponger, thief are hereby invited. The heavy-lipped slave is invited. The venerally, someone with venereal disease, is invited. There shall be no difference between them uh, and the rest. You know, elsewhere he um, he claim he he sort of. Uh, fashions himself as Jesus. He imagines himself um, to be Jesus. Um, now, on the way, on the way to that, um, he again, like Emerson, he claims to be divine. He says, uh, "Yeah, the, I, let me read both of these passages because they." This reinforces a couple of the themes we've seen. He says, I do not press my fingers across my mouth. I keep as delicate around the bowels as around the head and heart. Again, he's getting rid of all dichotomies. The bowels, bodily functions, are, are just as noble as the head and the heart. Copulation is no more rank to me than death is. I believe in the flesh and the appetites. Imagine how that played with a, you know, a 19th century uh, audience. Seeing, hearing, feeling are miracles, and each part and tag of me is a miracle. Divine am I inside and out, and I make holy whatever I touch or am touched from. Again, the, the kind of audacity of that, of stating that. The scent of these armpits, aroma finer than prayer. The scent of his armpits, he's saying, is, is finer than, than prayer. This head, more than churches, Bibles, and all the creeds, there, there's another way that he fulfills Emerson's ideas. Remember in, in I think it was in Self-Reliance, uh, or, or it may have been Nature, where Emerson starts by saying, look, you know, 
we're, we're experiencing God secondhand through these, you know, dogmas and, you know, the Bible that, you know, these, you know, uh, the, the writings of dead men, we need to experience it uh, directly. So, you know, Whitman picks, picks up that idea in <clears throat> section 30. He says, logic and sermons never convince. The damp of the night drives deeper into my soul. <clears throat> so, you know, where does he um, sort of identify himself with Jesus? Um, yeah. Man or woman, I might tell how I like you, but cannot. That there's one passage that leads I need to think maybe he was bisexual. Um, he says, um, yeah, this is in section. Where am I here? Sorry. Yeah, section 38, or sorry, section 40. He says, I, di I dilate you with tremendous breath. I buoy you up. Every room of the house do I fill with an armed force. Lovers of me, bafflers of graves. He says, and when you rise in the morning, you will find what I tell you is so. Um, so he, he's, that, that's a, a little bit of an esoteric um allusion to Jesus. Here's a more direct one on the next page. He says, accepting the rough deific sketches to fill out better in myself, bestowing them freely on each man and woman I see, discovering as much or more in a framer framing a house, putting higher claims for him there with his rolled up sleeves, driving the mallet and chisel, not objecting to special revelations, considering a curl of smoke, or a hair on the back of my hand, just as curious as any revelation. Uh, gosh, that's still... Uh, I already covered that one. Um, I mean, there were kind of some indirect relations to Jesus there. He's He's identifying himself as a carpenter, you know, framer, framing a house, and then talking about revelations. But give me one second. And yeah, that's the right page according to my note. Yeah, here it is, okay toward the end of section 39, that I could forget the mockers and insults, that I could forget the trickling tears and the blows of the bludgeons and hammers, that I could look with a separate look on my own crucifixion and bloody crowning. There's the obvious, where he, he's kind of taking on, he's claiming that he somehow is Jesus. I remember now I resumed the overstayed fraction, the grave of rock multiplies what has been confided to it or to any graves. Corpses rise, gashes heal, fastenings roll from me. I troop forth replenished with supreme power, one of an average unending procession. You know, remember Emerson believed like we could all be Jesus. Um, and, and Whitman is kind of uh, making that point in a very literal way here. Um, you know, of course, that there are, some very obvious differences in in Jesus's teachings and Whitman's. For one thing, as as I mentioned in an earlier, um, in one of the earlier lectures or yeah lectures, um, Jesus says, "I am the way, the truth, the life. No man, no one can come to me, come to the Father except through me." So that um, forecloses the side of everything being. Um, true somehow. But again, Whitman says, do I contradict myself? Very well, but I contradict myself. He wants to kind of have it, not just both ways, but all ways. 
Um, so, but he, again, he has some even more subtle illusions where at one point in the New Testament, Jesus says that, you know, in the, toward the end times, the people are going to want their ears to be tickled. And basically, they're going to want to hear what they want to hear. And Whitman, I think, kind of plays off of that in section 47. He says, I teach straying from me. Like he's, you know, he's the teacher and he's unlike Jesus who says, follow me. Whitman claims that he teaches, look, stray from me. Again, it's like Emerson saying that, or again, a paraphrase with the idea that the, the student shall become greater than the teacher. Uh, but here's the, the catch. He says, I teach strain from me, yet who can stray from me? Uh, in a way, I guess he's right. If, if you say you're everything, what is there to stray from? It's kind of like if, if you don't, Like if, if you if you have a word if you make up a word, loop. I just made that up, and I said you say what does that mean? I say oh that means anything and everything. Okay, well, then there there's no getting away from it, but also it becomes utterly meaningless because by their very nature, words communicate by um, by discrimination, right? By by distinguishing themselves from, from other words and what other words mean. My words itch at your ears till you understand them. That, that, that's the, uh, the illusion I was uh, pointed out. Um, all right, we're getting close to closing this out. <clears throat> Section 48. Whitman says, I have said that the soul is not more than the body, and I have said that the body is not more than the soul, and nothing, not God, is greater to one than oneself is. Nothing, not even God, is greater to one than oneself is. I, I don't have to probably explain to you how not just unorthodox that is, but from the point of view of orthodox uh, biblical truth, that's you know pure blasphemy. <clears throat> And I say to mankind, be not curious about God, for, for I who am curious about each am not curious about God. No array of terms can say how much I am at peace about God and about death. I hear and behold God in every object. Um, again, like Emerson, he's a pantheist, right? God is everything. Again, I go back to my earlier point. If God is everything, then really he's nothing, right? I mean, if, uh, if you just say that you can't see it from here, but that that uh, stool is God, uh, and that guitar is God, and this is God. Then, uh, you know, if God is everything, He's really nothing. Um, so, one more thing, one more passage. That's one of the the more one of those famous passages in Song of Myself. He says, this is the last section, section 52. I too am not a bit tamed. I too am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yawp over the roofs of the world. Barbaric, right? As opposed to civilized. Whitman prided himself again on being a poet of the people. You know, democratic, the lowercase d, a yawp. It's like a, a root, almost like a burp, right? He's not into being nice and ornate and pol uh, like the, you know, polite uh, literary artist who, who came before him. So yeah, we'll wrap it up with that.